Hanali Gronwald remembers getting called to the medical clinic where she served in Kabul, Afghanistan. Administrators wanted to be well-staffed in case of a terrorist attack during a United Nations meeting. It wasn't my day to work at the clinic that day. I usually worked on a Wednesday, but the Wednesday they called me and they said, you know, we, we suspect there's going to be an attack in Kabul on Saturday and we want you to be one of the medical staff present during a UN meeting in one of the hotels. And I did not realize that that attack was actually going to happen in our house that afternoon. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs radio network. According to church tradition, the Apostle Paul was killed outside the walls of Rome on June 29th. Beginning this year, we want Christians around the world to remember June 29th as the Day of the Christian Martyr. One of the ways we're going to honor the example of the martyrs here at the Voice of the Martyrs on this June 29th is to add the names of three people to the Martyrs Memorial at our headquarters here in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. The Martyrs Memorial is a black granite wall that's part of our headquarters building here. And on the wall are inscribed the names of men and women throughout history who gave their lives for the gospel and for the cause of Christ. It's a constant reminder to all of us here of the example of these great saints of the church, because you walk right by the monument as you come up to the front door of the Voice of the Martyrs. On the day of the Christian martyr, we're going to add the names of Werner Gronwald and his children, Jean-Pierre and Rede. Today we'll learn more about their story from Hannah Lee Gronwald. She was wife to Werner and mom to Jean-Pierre and Rede. She paid such a heavy price for the sake of the gospel in Afghanistan. The Gronwalds had a comfortable life in South Africa when God started stirring Werner's heart about the need for gospel workers in Afghanistan. He took a medical missions trip there, and then he and Hanali went on another trip together. And then they needed to decide, was God calling them to Afghanistan permanently? They had a, a comfortable life in South Africa. Hanali was an emergency room doctor. Werner was on staff at a church. And it was a tough question for them to think about moving to Afghanistan because it meant leaving that comfortable life and leaving even their own parents behind. This was the worst battle I had to fight my whole life. Wow. And that was actually the battle against my family. Oh. Not so much Werner's family because his parents were also really born-again Christians with a deep relationship with the Lord. My family as well, they are born-again Christians, but more also nominal mm -hmm. in the way my mom and dad made it so difficult for both of us. And they said, they insisted, God will never call a family with small children to a country like Afghanistan, a war-torn country. He will never do that. So that's for them a no-no. And it was a real battle to try to convince them, but God really calls people. It doesn't matter who you are. That was a difficult thing, a very so difficult battle. For you and Werner, how did you how did you work through that in a way? And I think of you know, wanting to honor your parents, but at the same time wanting to follow God's call. How did you balance those two? Luckily, Vanner was the strongest one and because he was always the leader and I was the follower. But I knew if I didn't have the sheer knowledge that I had a clear calling from the Lord, both of us, it would have been more difficult. Right. But we had to stand on our calling and what God was confirming to us. And that made it so much easier because you have to weigh then what's most important, God's calling or honoring your parents. And for sure, you have to honor God first. So what were some of the ways that God kind of confirmed that calling? You, you mentioned that, you know, again and again and again, he made it very clear what were some of the ways that he did that? Well, I remember one night I was just sitting in despair and asking the Lord while I was sitting outside in the garden, please just give me a sign that this is really from you. 
And at that stage, the phone was ringing and I thought, oh, no. And it was my mother-in-law and she just started to encourage me. And I thought afterwards, was this from the Lord or wasn't it? And because she was standing right behind us. And I, when I think back, I realized that that was one of the signs where God confirmed, but you have to go. And many people, God uses his children to confirm his calling. And many people came and they just said, you know, you should go. And I think one of the major things for us was when we had to get financial support. It's difficult. All missionaries know how difficult it is to get financial support. And Vanner, within two weeks, I think he raised 80% of what we needed. In two weeks? In two weeks' time. Wow. And it was a huge thing because we had to build a new house in Afghanistan where all the appliances and electrical things um, was concerned. So it was really a very big expense. And he raised all that money, not just our monthly support, but also to to move there in, in two weeks' time. Wow. That's two very much, weeks, I would say. yeah, it's very hard to argue with it when, when all those things are falling into place. As you move there, what were your thoughts about safety and security? And I, I mean, we're talked about it's a war zone. It's dangerous. Mm. We had to think about that before we went to Afghanistan. And that's really a thing of counting the cost for Christ. Because you know the calling, you know the danger, and we had to get to terms with that because we knew that for us maybe it's okay to get injured or to die, but not our children. And, you know, no one wants anything to happen to their children. So we also had to come to that terms of it's not our children, it's God's children. And he just he's lending the children to us. So it's his children and he will look after us. The basic thing is you had to know that this was a clear calling from the Lord. The moment you have a clear calling, you know that God gives you a mandate to be there. If if not, then you should not go because it's really a dangerous country to live in. I I think of the story of Abraham and Isaac, Abraham offering Isaac. It sounds like you and Werner really went through that same process of laying your kids on the altar and saying, okay, they're yours, Lord. Yes. Now, I must say, after the attack in South Africa, I got a lot of criticism about our going there because many people said they got what they were looking for. And they said, you don't ever take your family, especially your children, to a war-torn country like that. So that just revealed to me the state of their heart uh, where God's concerned. Yes, in an earthly manner, yes, you don't take your children your family there. But if God gives you the call to go there... I mean, that's that's what stands out. Then you go. Yes. Yeah. You have described Werner as fearless. Uh, talk a little bit about that and just what was the source of that fearlessness? You know, Fridays were our Sundays, and he always preached on being fearless. And <laughs> for me, fear is actually the acronym, and he also said the same thing. Fear is the acronym for future events appearing real. And he always said, you know, we should guard against being paralyzed by fear. Rather do the opposite and and have faith in God. Um, If you go to a country like Afghanistan and you live in fear all the time, then you will hide all the time and you will not be bold. I think that was a wonderful thing that he conveyed to the people there, the, the foreigners that were working there, to be bold. If you are afraid to sow the seeds of the word and to show love to the Afghans because you're afraid that they will put you out of the country, deport you or kill you, why are you there then? So for him, it was the number one thing to have faith and not fear, because that's the opposite thing of of fear is faith. How did your faith grow uh, as you as you made that transition? You you heard God's call. You said, okay, we're going to go. You saw God provide in really miraculous ways. And then you go and you get settled in Afghanistan. Talk about your personal spiritual growth through that process. Yes, it was through all these difficulties. No, life wasn't easy. There were no supermarkets just to get food every day. Where you were used to going to supermarkets in South Africa and like in America, you don't have it there. You don't have transport. You have to walk wherever you need to go. People staring at you, it's a a man's world. 
it's difficult for women to survive there, especially foreign women. Most foreigners have got drivers and people bring things for them to their houses. For us, it was different. Vanner was busy all the time. So if I had to wait for him to do things for me, nothing would have happened inside the house and we wouldn't have food to eat. <laughs> I think it took me a month or two months, actually two months, in Afghanistan before I had the courage to actually go out of our front gate and walk by myself to the market, to the bazaar, and to buy fruits and vegetables myself. And you had to learn the language. No one at that stage could really speak English. So you could not survive without the language. The security, the false security that we have in the West, because we've got the freedom, mm -hmm. I didn't have that there. And to see my children suffer, there were no, no schools for them at that stage. They didn't have a lot of friends. People came and went all the time. So that was in that difficulty is that you had to trust the Lord for the next step. Many people just stop their support without giving you notice. And then you thought, Lord, what are we going to do now? And then all of a sudden, there were amounts paid into your account, bank account, huge amounts. We, you didn't even know where they came wow. from. And it's just in that small way, you know, that I experienced the Lord. And God became real for me. Like he said, I'm your helper. For me, that's settled. God's my helper. He's my provider. And I saw that through the whole attack and how he sustained me afterwards. He's real. And I, I just wish that so many people can just experience that as well. Because I've experienced the Lord in a way that not many people do. But he's as real as you sitting there opposite me. And um, that's wonderful. That's so precious. I don't want to lose that ever. I love your description of God as our helper in a situation where you're completely isolated and cut off, everything's new, you don't speak the language, what do you need in that situation? You need a helper. Yes. God is our helper. He's there. He's with you. How did it change the dynamic of your family? I, I would think you would have bonded together very, very closely, just the fact that you're kind of in this, you, all you've got is each other and God. That's right. I must say, back in South Africa, when I worked so hard, I actually tried to avoid all the difficult situations in my home. <laughs> so that's why, you know, I worked a lot. And we had a nanny to look after the children. And then when we went to Afghanistan, all of a sudden I was with my family and the children 24 hours a day. And in many ways, it was very difficult. In a difficult way, I had to learn to learn about my children and their needs and how they actually were their personalities. I mean, you, you knew about that before, but it's dif different when you are 24 hours with yeah. them and you have to solve all the problems. You have to be the teacher, the doctor, everything that they need, you take on that role. So that was difficult. But as the years progressed, you know, we, we grew very close and we spent so much time together, especially me with the children. So we had a very, very close bond. Vanner had his things that he did, so many times he was in the office, but I was always with the children and their friends. So my house was always full of other children as well, sleep, sleeping over, and that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, you know, as we get into 2012, 2013, what's a, a typical day of ministry? What was your, your work on a daily basis? Well, okay, Vanner and myself had very different ministries. Mm -hmm. For me, it was always the homeschooling thing first. And so my day would start, you know, we would start 7 o'clock in the morning. We had our personal quiet times before that. Actually, Vanner had that. I woke up 7 o'clock and we had breakfast together. And then after that, we had family devotions until 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, Vanner went down to the office. And uh, I started with getting ready for the day. And I had my personal quiet time until about 9 o'clock, 9.30. And then I would start with school with the children, although they would start on their own already by mm -hmm. 8, 8 o'clock. And I had to sit with her day because she was an ADHD child. And just the one personal one-to-one -one attention that I gave her helped her tremendously. So she also went to the International School of Kabul for a few years, but it's difficult for a foreign girl when there are Afghan boys, Muslim boys, with her. So And they ridiculed her, and she wasn't ready for that. So... Much of my day, I taught her until about 1 o'clock, 1.30. And then in the afternoon, I took Jean-Pierre. Then I had to teach him. And it was like pushing and pulling and dragging this child because he didn't <laughs> want to do mathematics in the afternoon. And that was the subject he had real trouble with, science and so on. 
And and I, I had, I'm thinking not very many teenage boys want to do mathematics in the afternoon. It's so true, it's true, but we didn't have another choice. <laughs> yeah. So and then I had to study up all these work as well because I didn't know. I mean, I was more than 30 years ago. I was in school. So I had to study up the work, but I also had to keep up to date with medical, the medic, my medical career. And I saw patients. There was always a constant stream of patients phoning me or standing in front of the gate and wanting me to help them. So my day was full, and we, we didn't have servants in the house that would clean and cook. So I had to do that as well. So it was I totally felt overwhelmed in all this that I had to do. But that was a typical day, and when you saw, you know, the day was was gone. Yeah, it sounds like it was flew by. <laughs> you mentioned uh, your daughter Rode and and the the challenge of going to school, the challenge of being a, a young lady in an Afghan Muslim culture. How did she respond to that, and how did you, as a mom, go through that with her? It was really difficult for her. She wanted to go to school and be socially interactive, but because of ridicule from Muslim boys, she just couldn't take that. She couldn't handle that, and she begged me to homeschool her. And then when she grew up, it was amazing to see how these Afghan men could just spot <laughs> a girl, a teenage girl, and they were just staring, open-mouthed, you know, and you wanted to protect her. And even in the bazaars, it's it's actually awkward to say, but they always came and they rubbed themselves against you, you know, with an arm, and you had to protect. So I always walked behind her to try to protect her, and my husband always tried to walk behind me to protect me, but still they found ways to touch you, and... um if you just kept quiet about that, they would feel it's acceptable. So you always had to make a noise. And that was difficult for me to yeah. draw attention to us in the middle of a bazaar wow. because a man touched you um, inappropriately. Did you ever say, Lord, why you know, why are you putting her through this? <laughs> why did you call us here? It's so hard on her. What's going on? Did did some of that come out in your prayers? And how did how did God answer that? For years. I was on my knees before the Lord because, to me, it didn't make sense for a girl to grow up in such abnormal circumstances. And God never answered me. Never. <laughs> <laughs> because he knew in a few years it's not going to matter. He knew what his plan was or what he was going to allow. And so my difficulties... He used that to just draw me closer to him. But he knew it's not necessary for John Peer and today to get A pluses, you know, their, their um, grades in school. And also medical-wise, Rodea had scoliosis. And I was just praying about her back as well. Lord, what should we do? Because this child really needs physiotherapy. And physiotherapists, actually the whole service doesn't exist in Afghanistan. <laughs> so it was very difficult. and But God never answered me. But I, I kept being on my knees uh -huh. for this for this purpose. Did that affect your faith? I mean, did you feel like God should have answered you at the time? Were you frustrated by that? Or did... now, of course, you want answers, yeah. and it was tiresome. I really got tired because I didn't understand what was going on, and I questioned whether we were still in the right place. I questioned our calling uh, many times during the, those years when you uh, experience all these difficulties. I remember that I was questioning our calling. And then, you know, I couldn't share that with Werner because he would just say, okay, let's go and pack up and go back to South Africa. And I didn't want to be the cause for us packing up. So a few times I did mention that, and he was reacting in that way, being concerned for his family. Uh -huh. And I didn't want to give him an extra burden, so I kept quiet. This was something between me and the Lord. And I really felt that because I'm the woman, the follower, he's the leader, if we have to go back, God will reveal that to him as the husband and the leader. And I didn't want to nag Vanya to go back. So for me, I just kept quiet, and I believe that the Lord will show us in due time if we have to go back and win. And and Werner's ministry, and I know there's some security issues we may not be able to get into too much detail, but, but what was his ministry like uh, as far as blessing the Afghan church? His vision was 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, and he really wanted to train people to be faithful and to to train other people in as well. So okay. that was his vision. And in order to do that, he was involved with international leadership training and English training. And we, we together, we did community development education, 
training people from the rural areas, uh, agriculture, and, you know, just medical principles to uplift their own communities. Mm -hmm. And that was nice to do that. But he also, when people had questions, he trained them. We, we sowed seeds of the word. He trained people um, to be leaders in the Afghan church. If I had told you in 2012 or 2013, if I had said, Hana Lee, uh, your family is going to be martyred uh, and you're going to go through this and you're going to be faithful, what would you have said? I, I would have been dumbfounded. Uh, really, yeah. I remember about a month before the attack that um, there was all these attacks by ISIS in Iraq. And I told Vanna, you know, I know, I don't have enough faith. What if Taliban storms into our house and, and wants to kill us or do something bad? I don't have enough faith. And I think God prepared me because for that month or two months before the attack, I was on my knees before God in the mornings during my quiet time, and I was begging for more faith. And I think God was preparing me for this. But if you would have said that to me in 2012, 13, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have been strong enough to survive this um, beforehand. This is something that God takes you through. It's all his grace and his mercy. No one, no one is strong enough on their own to go through this. I, I want to talk now about 2014. And uh, your kids are in high school. They're finishing up the school year. Your family's getting ready to go back to South Africa for the holidays, probably thinking, man, this is going to be great. We're going to have a great time. In the weeks before the attack, uh, Werner made the statement, and actually he was he was preaching. He said, we only die once. It might as well be for Jesus. What was his mindset in the month before the attack? Did you sense like he knew something was going on or he knew a challenge was coming, or was that a typical sermon from him? No, this was actually a conference that we attended in China, and he had to speak on counting the cost for Christ. And that's just how he ended the sermon. But that happened exactly a month before the attack that we were in China. So that morning, November 29th, just a normal morning. I that mean, was you a normal just morning. get up, you went to do some work, the kids were at home. Uh, how did you find out this was not going to be a normal day? You know, until 4 o'clock the afternoon, when the attack already happened, I thought it was a normal day. <laughs> it wasn't my day to work at the clinic that day. I usually worked on a Wednesday, but the Wednesday they called me and they said, you know, we, we suspect there's going to be an attack in Kabul on Saturday. And we want you to be one of the medical staff present during a UN meeting in one of the hotels. And I did not realize that that attack was actually going to happen in, in our house that afternoon. That's Hanalee Gronwald describing the tragic events that led to her husband and her children being martyred in Afghanistan. Her family was killed, but Hanali was not alone. Next week, we're going to hear how this wife and mom leaned on the Lord as her true source of security. We're going to hear an honest account about grieving and see what it means to grieve as one who has hope for eternity. Next Saturday, we're going to honor the sacrifice this family made by placing the names of Werner, Jean-Pierre, and Rede Gronwald on the Martyrs Memorial at the headquarters of the Voice of the Martyrs. We're going to do that on the day of the Christian Martyr, June 29th, and you're invited to be a part of that through Facebook Live or through downloadable video that you can share with your Sunday school class or your small group. It's going to be a day of honoring the Gronwalds, but Maybe even more important, it's going to be a day where each of us is called to ask, what am I willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to give up to see the gospel go forward? So it's going to be a day of challenge and a day of inspiration as well. For more detail on how you can be a part, visit our website, vomradio.net. We'll have a link for you in the notes that go with this episode. You can also visit the main Voice of the Martyrs website, persecution.com. There'll be information there as well. You know, if God could sustain Hanalee Gronwald after every member of her family was martyred, he can help you with whatever's on your heart this week. He can help me with the things that are on my heart. We can trust God. 
Next week, Connolly is going to tell us how God has taken care of her since the death of her family, how he has given her hope for the future. You won't want to miss that on the day of the Christian martyr. So be back to join us next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.